Hi, uh, welcome to this short video on using Python and ImageJ or Fuji together. The audio that you're going to hear was recorded in December 2019 as part of the first Python for Bioimage Analysis course that we ran in Cambridge. Um, all I've done is put uh, videos of the web pages that I'm discussing roughly in sync with the audio. Oops. Apologies if they're a little bit out of sync here and there. Uh, the links for all of these web pages can be found in the repository and the link to the repository is right below this video. Um, I think that's it. Uh, hopefully it's useful. What I'm going to talk about is using Python with other things, but I'm going to focus on Fiji. Uh, so this is all relatively experimental. So first of all, uh, so someone asked, um, uh, someone asked the other day why I use Python inside ImageJ, and ImageJ has very kindly given some advantages and disadvantages. But today we're going to talk about using ImageJ inside Python, so this section. And pretty much the key advantage is that you can start to combine ImageJ with other things. Now we've already played with Cyclic Image. I think you might get exposed a little bit to OpenCV on Friday. Um, and I think. Uh, I heard someone talking about ITK recently, but ITK is like a segmentation uh, system you can use. Um, you can also combine it with visualization suites or with data analysis suites that aren't listed here. It does have some disadvantages, and this partic the particular disadvantage, actually I don't think they've listed the biggest disadvantage there. The biggest disadvantage is that Java and Cell Profiler and IC and all of these things that you might already use in a graphical way are all written in Java, uh, and Python and Java don't really like each other. This is because Java's horrible. <laughs> um, ImageJ is written in Java for, for historical reasons to do with the fact that Java was all the rage in the 1980s. Um, if I had a time machine, one of the places I would go is back to the 1980s and destroy Java <laughs> early on. Um, Python, on the other hand, so Java is, is what's called an object-based language. So it works in terms of you define a, an abstract object and it has various sub-objects and things. And it's really hierarchical, whereas Python is a scripting language. It allows it to be quite fluid. You just kind of write what you want and it gets done. These two paradigms don't work well together. And so one of the other reasons that I'm doing more of a talk and less of a code-based system uh, today is that I did write a code-based tutorial. and. Uh, we're not quite sure why, but it doesn't work anymore. So what I was saying about this, what I'm going to talk to you about over the next hour or so as being experimental, it really is. Everything I'm going to talk to you about is version 0, not version 1 yet. The reason I'm going to talk to you about it, though, is because in a year's time or two years' time, version 1 will come out. And it's probably worth you knowing that these things exist and that they are being developed and having a vague idea of what they might be able to do so that in the future, you might go, oh, hang on. What I'd really like to do is call that ImageJ plugin from inside a big, long script of Python that I've already got so that I don't have to rewrite that particular bit of code. I'm going to double check and see how good the Python ImageJ integration has got. And if you do that in a month's time, the answer will be not very good. If you do that in a year's time, the answer might be yeah, a bit better. But if you do that in a couple of years' time, the answer will probably be, oh, it's actually working now. Um, yeah, so Paul and I spent most of the day yesterday at the back trying to work out why it wasn't working anymore, and we're still not sure. Uh, I think we've settled on blaming Java. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about how this works. So the key thing that I'm going to talk about is this package called PyImageJ. And the reason I'm going to do it on web pages is I kind of want to expose you to GitHub a little bit. You've already seen it if you've downloaded the course materials. But GitHub is a fantastic repository that has an awful lot of things Python and non-Python related. This particular one is called PyImageJ. And like our repo, you can see its, its file structure, and then you can see its readme automatically rendered. So key point here, PyImageJ provides a set of wrapper functions for integration between ImageJ and Python. There's also, and I will talk about this briefly, a way of invoking the ImageJ server API. So over the last five years, ImageJ have put a lot of um, emphasis on um, 
make an image jade more cross-platform, more cross-system, and easier to access. So those of you who are kind of super image jade users will have noticed that they were brought in the ability to use a lot more languages and scripting. They also developed this thing called image J ops, which is meant to be a really, um, I can't remember the word they use, but it's meant to be a Java-based system that can be used by anything else that's Java, rather than just by image J. Uh, and they've also more recently introduced a thing called the image J server. And what the image J server does is it's like image J, but you can kind of send almost web commands to, uh, to and fro from it to control the image J. So we will talk about that briefly, but primarily PyImageJ integrates between an ImageJ gateway, which is basically the same as if you double click the Fiji icon and it opens an object, and it just interacts with it in a programmatic way. It's, the, the reason they're doing it is so that you can control it from pretty much anything, so you can integrate it into any existing pipeline, whatever the language, and also that you can do kind of completely remote things, so if you have a central server running all your, your analysis, you don't have to be connected to that server. There's other mentalities as well, but that's the one that I think is the most useful from it. Um, yeah, so an ImageJ gateway is essentially like opening ImageJ locally, but you can programmatically control it. Uh, you can then think about, instead of doing all those button clicks on ImageJ, you could write a Python script that's going to open an ImageJ gateway and do all the button clicks based on the commands that you've programmed. And then, in theory, if this is something you do regularly, you just run your Python script with a file name and that's your process done. So the idea behind it is a little bit like running macros, being able to batch process, but like I said earlier, you get the added benefit that you could do your image J process inside your Python script, and then at the end, you can have a load of pandas data analysis, which instead of giving you a big CSV file with 100,000 lines from your multi-well plate high throughput experiment, just gives you the numbers that you're actually after from that experiment. Uh, it also makes it easier to share the way that you're doing something. So if you do all the clicking by hand, then you're going to have to record yourself doing all the clicking by hand or go over to that other person's computer and show them where all the clicking buttons are and things like that. If you can write it all in a, in a massive script like Python with all of the processes there, you can just send that to a user or a collaborator and they can run that locally. A couple of kind of useful things to be aware of, I'm actually going to go to, so that for those who don't know, there is a, another GitHub repository called ImageJ Tutorials, and it has a set of notebooks which they're still currently developing. They're not fully developed. One of them is about using the uh, PyImageJ kernel, and you can see here that you can just you just import ImageJ. We've done importing in Python, and then you initialize an ImageJ object. And there are several ways to do that. Some of them are really reproducible. Some of them are not. So you can initialize with an online version. Um, uh, such as this, so this is initializing with a specific version of Fiji, but you can also initialize with your local installation, and that's really useful if you've got any fancy plugins installed, because they might not necessarily be activated in the online version. However, the online version is really nice because you can send it to anyone in the world, and they'll have the exact same version of Fiji that's going to run all of the codes in your Python script. Apart from that, really, I want to highlight two features about the way PyMSJ works, and then I'm going to talk about how you, how you interact with developmental packages in general. The first one is because Python is Python and ImageJ is Java, you have to do a lot of this. Py to Java, and if, you scroll, uh, if I scroll down because you've not got this loaded, also um, there should be Py from Java. Uh, so the annoying thing about interacting with ImageJ from within a Python environment is that the way Python stores and looks at data and the way Java stores and looks at data is quite different. We imagine a long pipeline. You've got a load of images. For each image, you want to load it, do some pre-processing with scikit-image. Then you want to pass it to an ImageJ plugin that you've been using for years and you don't want to change from because you know it works and you know what parameters to use, so on and so forth. Then you want to take those results and play with them in pandas to do some statistics. There's a bit in the middle before you can send it to that ImageJ plugin where you're going to convert your Python data into ImageJ data. And then afterwards, you're going to convert your, uh, your Java or ImageJ data back into Python data to carry on. 
when you're in kind of image J mode, once you've sent your data to image J in a Java mode, there's a whole range of ways you things you can do. So you can run macros. So you can either write the macro in Python as a string and send it to image J, but you can also run macro files. So if you've already got 100 macro files for your facility or that you've been donated by the last post up or whatever, you can run that file directly from within Python using the image J pi run macro. Uh, you can also run, uh, so that can be in any language. So if it's, if it's, sorry, if it's in macro language, you run it with the macro command. If it's in any other language, such as Groovy or Python, you run it with the script command. But it's all the same. You can also run plugins. Uh, so in theory, you can run any plugin that's in that version of image J that you've initialized. So this one actually runs the macro to get the blob image. It gets the, that image, shows it. It then apparently does a mean. However, this is a square mean of pick of. Uh, this should be a square mean of. Uh, 10 by 10, and uh, if you look at this image and this image, you'll notice they're actually identical. So their tutorial is slightly broken uh, and not actually showing what it should do. I will, in a second, show you a bit more GitHub where I created what's called a GitHub issue to tell them that that was broken, and we'll talk about how you can use those to interact with development teams for these sorts of projects. Um, the other key point, if anyone has used ImageJ already, or indeed if anyone writes ImageJ macros quite a lot, the format of actually you getting ImageJ to do things should be relatively, uh, high ImageJ to do things should be relatively familiar um, in that I think if you write your, definitely if you write your macros in JAGS and like Todd showed on Monday, you'll do things like this in the middle of your macros. But even if you write them in Groovy, you'll be ImageJ macro late language, this idea of uh, this hierarchic ideal of accessing the ops section first, and then in this case, the health function, or I think there's another op, accessing the ops section first, and then the transform section, and then the function you're actually interested in below, <coughs> should be fairly familiar. So that's pi image j, and that's probably going to become a, quite a useful library for migrating existing systems into from Fiji and ImageJ into Python in the future. It's worth noting that I think you can also interact with Cell Profiler through Python. So if, you're, if you've got a pipeline that's currently going through, say, a bit in ImageJ and a bit in Cell Profiler, if you have a bit of preprocessing that's in Python, uh, Fiji and Cell Profiler, then it's going to be quite easy as, uh, in time to create a, a Python script that's able to do it all for you from one place. And you can do it all from within the notebook as well. So it's still that, got that visual environment. The other thing I wanted to quickly mention about PyAmageJ before going on to working with experimental developmental packages in general is there is a sub module for PyAmageJ called uh, PyAmageJ Server. And this accesses, as I said, that new server mode of ImageJ. In theory, I actually think that the server, this PyAmageJ server looks like it's going to be more useful for Python writers, just in the way that it interacts with the PyAmageJ server and the ease of which you can send information to and from it. It seems like it's going to be more intuitive. Uh, so I kind of just want to make people aware that there is this additional sub-project going on with PyAmageJ that may in the long run be an easier way to integrate an existing ImageJ workload into Python. However, I would like to point out, it's very flaky at the moment. This was not the bit that broke, but I did cause this to break several times. 